Oregonians for Science and Reason is a Northwestern United States resource for scientific skeptical news, events, and philosophy that promotes advocacy of public understanding of the scientific method, rational thinking, and the positive effects that such understanding and knowledge can have on people's lives. Uh, around the world and, uh, 
on assignment for them. He's also written more than more than uh, he's written four now popular science books, including the one that he'll be speaking about tonight. And I have just a few remaining copies for sale. I have four remaining copies uh, that we're selling at the best price you can get of his book, ten dollars. So if you're interested, uh, I can take a check or or cash for that. Um, so let me give you a uh, and you go back. Right? <laughs> here back in Oregon. I lived in Oregon for the last 12 years. Glad to be back. I, I go to Eugene every summer. Many of you know the Skeptics Toolbox. And, uh, I have to say, much of what I know, I learned at the Skeptics Toolbox. So I'm grateful for Ray Hyman and his crew for doing what they do every summer. The only organ I know is uh, Eugene in the middle of the summer. So now I know more about uh, Oregon and, and how to pronounce it. <laughs> and uh, not only that, I, I got some insight into what Oregon's like when it's not uh, Eugene in the summer, because it, there's a traditional gift that Eugene uh, gave me that, that was started, I think, when she, Eugenie Scott was the guest speaker, and it rained like hell. And uh, so ever since then, the, the guest speaker, it's one of these. <laughs> I will treasure this uh, for a long time, and I certainly appreciate it. I was thinking about uh, coming out here so the uh, organ was on my mind and uh, as I was teaching my class, I teach a chemistry class, I wasn't teaching it yet, it was before class, so I was walking around. This was Wednesday, true story, not looking up. Uh, this was Wednesday and I was walking around the class and uh, before the class began and you know, you try to bond with your students appropriately. So and this one, one kid in the class was looking uh, at some girl that he was talking to, so, and he was wearing a baseball hat as students do these days, and so all I could see was this side of his baseball hat. And I, I looked at it with Oregon on my mind, and, and, it, and it said C-K-S. So of course you know the first thing that popped into my mind. And I said to him, I can't believe it, you got a duck's hat on, you know? And, and he turns his head toward me, and the girl starts giggling. And what do you think it said? Oh, uh, that's rude. <laughs> no, that's where your mind is. <laughs> Slap him down. <laughs> what do you think it said? Come on, New York. Knicks. 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 <laughs> I would think it's about New York. <laughs> it said the Knicks. So uh, when I go to the airport, I'm going to have to get. And, oh, and then. I, and then they started laughing. I said, well, ducks, ducks, they call their team the ducks. They thought that was the funniest thing. <laughs> they, they just laughed. The girls were making fun of this guy because I thought this guy was wearing a duck's hat. So I, I have to, when I get to the airport, I have to bring something to, that it wasn't just a joke. It was dead serious. Ducks. So anyway, we're here to do other things tonight and to, uh, to talk about what you've already said to talk about this book. And I just want to give you a sense of where, where it all came from and why I wrote it and why I think it's of any significance and what, what it might lead to. And, and so that's, that's where we we'll, we'll go tonight. And then any questions, certainly hang around with the questions. But uh, let me just say that in the history of the United States, there have been many defining moments. And uh, there are some of these defining moments in the history of the United States of America that we, we, we are cause for celebration among Americans. Uh, we all know that on July 4th, 1776, we declared our independence from Britain and uh, democracy was born in this country. And so every July 4th, we say happy birthday America, and it's a cause for celebration. 
other day is May 8th. I'm talking about my birthday, May 8th, 1945. It's not my birthday. <laughs> and what was that? VE Day. VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. The day of victory for the Allies in World War II. And that was cause for celebration. And on that day, men and women took to the streets to express their joy that the war in Europe was finally over. On the other hand, there are defining moments in the history that we commemorate because they are tragic, because there's death and calamity and suffering associated with them. But what defines us as a nation is how we respond to these events. And so on the morning of December 7, 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy conducted a surprise military attack on the naval base in Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. The attack was a profound shock to the people of America. In response to that, we were led directly into entry in World War II. This horrific act, the horrific nature of this devastating attack, led our President Franklin Roosevelt to proclaim December 7, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. And then, of course, there was <coughs> September 11, 2001. Now, do you remember where you were? Most people do. On September 11, 2001, when you first became aware that the World Trade Center had been attacked. Most people do, and so do I. And here's where I was. It was about 8.45 in the morning. I was home. I was watching a videotape, a TV videotape, of an episode from a television series called The Ascent of Man. Jacob Bernas. In 1973, I believe, that's when that program was created. And it had about, I think, 13 episodes. This particular episode, my favorite, was called Knowledge or Certainty. And Dr. Bernowski was discussing the rise of Hitler in Germany and other tyrants elsewhere. And he was discussing the confrontation between the ascent of man and these despots, Hitler and others, belief in the absolute certainty of their ideologies. And in the final scene of this episode, Dr. Bernowski stands at the edge of a pond in Auschwitz, a pond that contains the ashes of his family, and of his friend and fellow scientist, Leo Zawar. And he says, there are two parts to the human dilemma. One is the belief that the end justifies the means. That push button, Dr. Bernowski says, is the betrayal of the human spirit the assertion of dogma that closes the mind turns a nation, a civilization, into a regiment of ghosts, obedient ghosts, tortured ghosts. And he continues, Dr. Bernowski continues, and he says, it is said that science will dehumanize people and turn them into numbers. That is false. Tragically, folks, look for yourself, he says. This is the concentration camp and crematorium at Auschwitz. And into this pond were flushed the ashes of four million people. And that was done not by gas. That was done by arrogance. It was done by dogma. 
It was done by ignorance. And when people believe that they have absolute knowledge, no test in reality, this is how they behave. This is what men do when they aspire to the knowledge of God. He says, I owe it as a scientist to my friend Leo Szilard. I owe it as a human being to the many members of my family who died in Auschwitz to stand here by this pond as a survivor and a witness. We have to cure ourselves of the itch for absolute knowledge and power. We have to close the distance between the push-button act, the push-button order, and the human act. And what Dr. Bernowski does next in this episode is forever etched in my memory. And I urge you to try to find The Ascent of Man at your library or Amazon. I'm sure it's for sale. And look at the whole series, but look at this particular episode, Knowledge Certainty. He's fully dressed. You can see him up here. He slowly walks into that very pond at Auschwitz. And he reaches down. And he holds in his hands the mud-soaked ashes of his family, my family, maybe your family. But certainly he holds in his hands the ashes of the human family. When I removed that tape of Dr. Bernowski from my VCR and the television set, there was a television program that was going. And what appeared on the screen, I saw a smoldering World Trade Center. 845, remember? 845. 10 of 9, that's about the time we all saw it. And I listened to the commentary, the, the confused commentary, just like each of you. Try to remember back. I was confused. I was, I was stunned. I was shocked. What's going on? And like each of you, I desperately needed some answers as to what's going on. What could inspire one group of human beings to engage in the mass destruction of other human beings? What inspired these people was a malignant version of a religious belief. An actively evil interventionist version of that belief. A version that contrasts markedly with the benign, non-interventionist religious beliefs of billions of other people who seek to lead moral lives and in which they do not try to impose their beliefs on other people. People who used airplanes that day as weapons of mass destruction, those people believed that their actions were justified by their interpretation of the Koran, the Muslim holy book or scripture. An interpretation in which every word in that book is taken to be the literal truth. They believed with certainty that their version of religion is the only acceptable. These people believed that Jacob Bronowski had said that they had absolute knowledge with no test in reality. Theirs is, as Jacob Bernowski had said to me moments ago, an assertion of dogma that closes the mind. It turns a nation, a civilization, into ghosts, obedient ghosts, <coughs> tortured ghosts. Now, the Koran does contain sections that support violence, as well as sections that justify warfare as a means to achieve certain ends. And as such, the Koran has served to legitimate 
violent campaigns oftentimes against other faith communities. Koran, however, is not the only religious scripture that encourages violence. The Hebrew Bible and the New Testament also contain passages that encourage violence. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And as long as religious people persist in accepting at face value every single word and idea in their scripture, many of these people, Jews, Christians, Muslims, will continue to act as warmongers. And so, it's vitally important that Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike realize that many of the passages that are misused in contemporary situations to support violence and war are better translated differently, not read correctly, not as they were intended. Some may be, some may not be. We want to know the difference. Some are interpreted in historically inaccurate ways, naively. And Jews and Christians and Muslims alike must realize that to be properly translated and understood, one should interpret and remain faithful to the primary spiritual aims of their faiths and be constrained by these aims. one do. One of the most direct ways, in my opinion, to challenge the assertion that every statement in scripture is the literal truth and should be accepted at face value is to examine scriptural statements in the Bible and in the Quran about the history of the universe and the genesis and development of life forms. Now that may sound like a strange idea at first, so hear me out. If people can be convinced that the biblical and Quranic statements about these matters are not literal truths, then hopefully they can begin to question other biblical and Quranic statements and by so doing, become empowered to question their teachers, be they imams, rabbis, ministers, priests. These teachers who claim that every word in scripture is inerrant. And this kind of questioning doesn't have to be, it is not meant to be irreverent at all. In fact, it can be a tool to improve one's understanding of one's faith by question and discuss openly. Now let's take a look at science's uh, scenario about life forms in the universe. The validity of science's 14 billion year scenario about the history of the universe and the genesis of life forms and their development is abundantly supported by a variety of reality-based lines of reason. And the scenario that's depicted in the theory of evolution by natural selection is literally true. The universe is about 14 billion years old. Earth is about 5 billion years old. About 4 billion years ago, simple life forms did first appear on Earth. And these life forms evolved into more complex life forms that eventually evolved into a variety of species. And Homo sapiens, or modern humans, did make their first appearance on Earth more than 100,000 years ago. So says the scientific scenario. Now in dramatic contrast to this scenario, the book of Genesis states that God created the universe in six days. That's what it says. 
and that during these six days, God created all variety of species, all variety of species or kinds, including the human species in the form of Adam and Eve. That's what it says. And by summing up the generations listed in the Hebrew Bible, adding in those six days and six literal 24-hour days, the age of the earth and the universe, as well as the duration of human beings, is less than 10,000 years ago. And the Koran also states that God created the universe and earth in six days. It attributes the origin of life to God and says that after earth was populated with other life forms, God created the first humans as Adam and Eve. That's what it says. Now, if science's theory of evolution by natural selection is literally true, these scriptural scenarios obviously cannot also be literally true. But nevertheless, belief in scriptural literalism claim that the scriptural scenarios are literally true is alarmingly widespread, not limited to a single faith. A recent Gallup poll says that about 47% of Americans persist in believing that the human species is less than 10,000 years old. What's even more scary than this to me is that among the high school biology teachers in public schools in the United States of America, people with advanced degrees, I mean, you know, probably a master's degree in something in education or biology, 13% of those people believe in creationism. 13% people who are teaching our high school students about biology don't believe in the theory of evolution. That's scary stuff. Now, what about the mindset of these people? Many of these believers in scriptural literalism do so out of a fear. The fear has to be appreciated. And the fear is that if they accept evolution, they have to reject, therefore, not only their scriptures, but their religion itself. And that to them is a price, and I think you can appreciate the fear they have, at least, even though you may not share it, and some of you may, but that's a price that they're simply not willing to pay, under the belief that it's either or. So what to do about it? Well, to shed light on this dilemma and help resolve it, what I did was I asked a Jewish scientist, a Christian scientist, and a Muslim scientist, each of whom was convinced about the validity of the theory of evolution by natural selection and is prepared to explain why in great detail, but is also an active participant in their own religion to answer two questions, two very specific questions, in a book that's titled, Let There Be Evolution, Let There Be Evolution, Reconciling the Book of Genesis, the Koran, and the Theory of Evolution. Question one, as it says up there, is what scientific evidence can you provide to help people of all faiths except science's theory of evolution. There's not a taint of religion in question one. It's to be answered purely in the rubric of science. And each one did that in, in, in his own way. Question two then, predicated on question one, if that's what you believe about the theory of evolution, how can you and have you indeed reconcile that theory of evolution with the, 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 the scriptures in your faith? And the scriptures meaning the words in the books that are the bedrock of the belief systems. For your information, the, 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 the Jewish scientist that, that, that I found happens to be a rabbi, conservative rabbi, David Rabbi David K, uh, Congregation of Oheb Shalom 
in Orlando, Florida. He's got a degree in ecology, ethology, and evolution. The Christian scientist is Dr. Howard J. Van Til. He's a professor emeritus of physics and astronomy at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he's a member of the Christ Community Church in Spring Lake, Michigan. And the Muslim scientist is Dr. T. O. Shanavas. And he's a pediatrician in Adrian, Michigan, and he's a member of the Islamic Center of Greater Toledo. It's interesting why, why Dr. Shanavas became interested in this particular project. It's not my project, but in, in the quest to try to deal with the issues. And it all started with his son. Dr. Shanavas was attending the mosque in Toledo and bringing up his family, his children, in the tradition. And in the tradition, his children went to the religious schools. And in the religious schools, his son was learning about creationism. And he came home to his father one day, and he said, Dad, I'm confused. I go to school, I go to public school, they're teaching me about the theory of evolution. I go to the mosque, they're teaching me about this creationism, which is antithetical to evolution. Can you help me out? What, 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 what should I believe? What can I believe? And this started Dr. Shanavas in a, in a long-term project where he, 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 he studied the Quran. He's a Quranic scholar now. Uh, and uh, and um, he studied the theory of evolution in great detail. And he, he found a way in his own mind and was comfortable with reconciling it. In the moment, I'll give you some hints about how he was able to do that, but he managed to reconcile the two. Now, what that made him for his son was a role model. He was a role model for his son, a role model of someone who can indeed reconcile the scripture and the science. But he's more than a role model for his son. He's a role model for all Muslims. Where I'd like him to be, that's my agenda. You know, they say scientists have an agenda. <laughs> that's my agenda. I'd like Dr. Shanavas to be a role model for all Muslims, as I hope Rabbi K will and can be a role model for all Jews. And Dr. Van Til can be a role model for all Christians. And so their answers are a sort of a testimonial to the possibility of reconciliation. Now, unfortunately, Adolf Hitler and Osama bin Laden are also role models to some people. I doubt about that with this event. Fortunately, Mahatma Gandhi and Jacob Bernowski are role models for other people. As are Dr. Shanavas, Rabbi Kay, and Howard Van Til. And so is every person in this room a role model. Role models are perhaps the most effective agents of change, for better or worse, in our world. And the most important role models are not necessarily superstars or headliners. They're everyday people. The coaches, the teachers, the parents. But essentially, they're people about whom one would say, you know, I'd like to be like that. I'd like to be like that. It's a role model. And they model themselves on that person. And so in addition to Rabbi Kay, Dr. Shanavas, Dr. Van Til, in addition to Mahatma Gandhi and Jacob Bernowski, if you want to make the world a better place, you could do so just by being a better role model. And I guess if this were a church, as, as there will be tomorrow morning at the uh, congregational United Church of Christ, I would probably say a, a, a 
good example is a great sermon, to put it in that language. Now, not surprisingly, the responses of these three scientists to these two questions reveal a lot of similarities in their thinking. They're handpicked by me because I have an agenda, no doubt about it. But also, not, 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 not surprisingly, you will find differences in their opinions. They don't agree about everything. Would be surprised if they did, because they're coming from different religious perspectives. And here's the point about this. What do you do about this confliction? To the best in its, it's in the best interest of this planet that we focus on the areas of agreement and we focus on the areas of agreement rather than dwell upon the differences which certainly do exist. And it's in our collective interest as a humanity because we've got to find better ways to share this planet with people that hold other worldviews. Because if we can't find ways to do that, we're going to risk further acts of destruction. Now, in case you're wondering how Rabbi Kay and Drs. Van Til and Shanavas make their reconciliation just to give you a brief idea of some of the kinds of things they would have to say about this. According to Rabbi Kay and Dr. Van Til, hey, listen, the Bible was never intended to be a book of science in the first place. So it's inappropriate to criticize its science because it's not that in the first place. The Bible is filled with metaphor, deliberately so. And therefore, it, it doesn't need to be taken literally all the time. The six days are not necessarily need to be considered our 24 hour days. A lot of biblical writing is considered as poetry and is intended as poetry and should be afforded poetic license for whatever that's worth. There are stories in the Bible that can be looked at reasonably as morality tales. Noah and the Flood. What's that all about? It's not that it has to be taken literally. It can be taken, you know, children's stories. They're not all true. The ones you read to your kids or were read to you. Literal Flood, literal Noah, little, literal Ark. Maybe it's just a morality tale about what happens to people when they're not worshiping or being obedient to their God. So that's the kinds of things that one could do if one is interested in reconciling scripture and the science. Now what about Dr. Shanavas? He's got a different perspective. He doesn't do this. What he does and what he says is this. And he backs it up and you know, you can criticize his line of reasoning, you can take a look at it and do whatever you want with it, but the, the gist of what he says and the way he sees it is that, the, the, that science is already embedded, was embedded in the Koran when it was written. And he said, well, I don't see DNA, I don't see the word nebula, nebular hypothesis in, in the Koran, of course you don't. But what he argues is that there are expressions and descriptions in which a, a, a phenomena, for example, uh, there are terms when, when they talk about something emerging from the smoke. And uh, he, he, he says, well, that, 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 that's really uh, the nebula, the gas clouds from which a solar system comes into being. And you try to read it in the context of what they're saying. And, he finds that that works. And he does it in many places in the Koran. And you know, I can't do justice to his argument, uh, certainly not as well as he can. But that's the kind of thinking, just in case you're wondering how Dr. Shani, that other Muslims might do it differently, of course. But that's, and other Muslims, I will tell you, he's not alone. He's not the only person who suggests that, that modern science is, 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 was embedded in the Koran when it was written. I'll bet you most people in this room don't know very much about the Koran. 
nor do I pretend that I'm a Quranic scholar by any means. So, you know, you're kind of mystified and wondering, and rightly so, and maybe the S word, skeptical. And that's okay. There you go. Take a look. See if it makes sense. Play around with it. Uh, but Dr. Shanabas is comfortable with what it's worth. Now, September 11, 2001, certainly not the first demonstration of the human capacity for extreme violence. It wasn't the first day that outrageous acts resulted from ignorance and superstition. On September 11, 2001, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by fanatical religious zealots. Again. And to paraphrase Franklin Roosevelt's statement, September 11 was one more day which will live in infamy. The remedy to ignorance and superstition is free inquiry. What's the name of the magazine? I question. And it's dangerous not to question. Because if you don't question, believers become vulnerable to propaganda. And that propaganda can present the understandings of some other group, not their group, as dangerous, disagreeable, false, even heretical. <clears throat> and they get trapped in their own religious perspectives, and they get blinded to what are the fruits of free inquiry. So to we who value the rights of all human beings, to we who define humanity as a community that extends beyond the national and religious and ethnic boundaries, the destruction of any group, any group, has devastating ramifications for our entire species. So defining humankind is not the privilege of one nation or group. It's the prerogative of all human beings. And now, the way that people communicate about this and these ideas with each other are much more interactive nowadays. And so if we want to Find a home for peace in this increasingly interactive world where things are coming at us pretty fast. It's imperative that we listen thoughtfully to the communications about the faith of other people. Thoughtfully. Including the secularists. Because if we listen thoughtfully, then we have a chance of bridging these bridges of understanding between people, and peace can find a home in the world we live in. So let us therefore heed the words of Mahatma Gandhi. He warned us that our ability to find unity in diversity is going to be the beauty and the test of our civilization. We have to build bridges instead of destroying them. Now that I've explained to you what motivated me to create this, this book and what I hope to accomplish by its publication, one final question that remains that I want to deal with. How much influence can a book have in the war against terrorism? That's a good question. It really is. In a book, <clears throat> help solve problems that are long-standing and deeply embedded. A book. Am I just kidding myself, thinking that my book could accomplish anything significant in the war against terrorism? Well, of course it would be naive of me to believe that such a book as this would dramatically alter the mindsets of people who carry out attacks that are as horrific as the ones that took place on September 11. But it can do this. It can clarify the issues, 
carefully. You can read it. It can serve as a catalyst for change. And it can sow the seeds of understanding, which one would hope can grow. There's a book called The Ethics of the Fathers. It's a compilation of the ancient, timeless wisdom of the Jewish sages. And in that book, Rabbi Tarfan tells us and admonishes us, it is not incumbent upon you to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. And so it's my long-term hope that the efforts of Dr. Van Til and Shanavas and Rabbi Katie bear fruit. They can convince people, hopefully, who need to be convinced that accepting evolution does not need <coughs> be the cause for rejecting your religion. It's not an either-or proposition that can convince people of that who will hold them up as role models and model themselves after those three people. Now, I have to say, there are some people, and some of them may be here tonight, and I know such people, who feel that attempts such as mine to reconcile science and religion are misguided. That evolution does require rejecting religious beliefs. And according to many of these people, religious beliefs, such as those of Rabbi Kay and Dr. Shanavas and Van Til, cannot stand up to scientific scrutiny and therefore should be entirely done away. I know such I want to remind these people that even Daniel Dennett, a prominent non-theist who believes that religion is nothing more or less than a natural phenomenon, also believes, quote, that religions can bring out the best in a person. And according to Dennett, quote, Religion makes people rise above themselves. Religion gives people a perspective on life that helps them make the decisions that we all would be proud to make. Daniel Dennett says, quote, there's much for religion lovers to be proud of in their traditions, and much for all of us to be grateful for. For example, according to the National Opinion Research Center surveys, Religiously committed Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus are not only encouraged to engage in virtuous behaviors like forgiving and being compassionate and, and being charitable, they do engage in such behavior. Religiously committed individuals not only advocate charitable giving, they are more charitable than the non-religious. I also want to remind these people that the founder and director of the Skeptic Society, Michael Shermer, in his book, Why Darwin Matters, informs us, quote, religion thrives in the modern age because it still serves a useful purpose as an institution for social cohesiveness and as a guide for finding personal meaning and spirituality, a function that Shermer says science has left largely untouched. Now, many members of the Skeptic Society, Michael Shermer Skeptic Society, describe themselves as secular humanists. And in this room, you describe yourself as a secular humanist. And secular humanists, their search for ethical principles is not based on scriptural authority. Rather, it's based on whether the ethical principles that are put forth do indeed <coughs> aid in the enhancement of human well-being. That's where they derive their ethical principles. And because of that, secular <coughs> humanism clearly does provide an alternate, non-scriptural pathway to being virtual. But since religion <coughs> and secular humanism 
both provide pathways to being virtuous. It's in their common interest to respectfully understand each other. And in the spirit of respectful understanding, those people who express faith in scriptural truths should not be disrespected by secular humanists. And secular humanists who respectfully doubt the truth of scripture shouldn't be censured by religious groups. Well, I've covered a lot of ground here tonight. Covered a lot of bases. Made some people happy, defended some people. We don't know, but that's what it's all about. Uh, this is what I think. That's why I'm here. Uh, we've gone from Genesis 1, in which God says, let there be light, to let there be evolution. We've hopefully gone from respectful understanding to peace. To which I want to add, few words, inshallah, that's Arabic, for if Allah words. In Yitzah Hashem, that's Hebrew, for if God wills it. And God so will it, which is English, American, Canadian. Australia and even Oregon for God so well. And so you're going to get the spectrum of responses. And in the final analysis, you know, with anything, with being a Republican or a Democrat or, or whatever it is, you're going, to, you're going to make a final judgment. You may not quite like this candidate, but you're going to vote for him because he's better than the other one and you'll go with this way and that. So I mean, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not giving you any definitive answer except to say that, that it, 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 there's really complex issues there and there's good and bad that these people would see in both sides, and they would end up making a judgment by weighing one side versus the other. And as long as, you know, I'll tell you this, that frankly, my own attitude about life is that the truth is not the most important value. I really don't think so. What's more important is peace. What's more important is people getting along. What's more important is people being nice to one another. So to try to ruthlessly pursue 
the truth at all costs. I'm not, some things need, some things are better off left alone. You get a little boil here, don't pick that. It's better off being left alone, you're going to heal faster. So certainly, I mean, I'm not saying what you're saying doesn't make sense. I'm just talking about an emphasis and where we should put it. So, right. so there are people who come up with answers to these things, and you may not be happy with those answers. And then I say, well, Lou, where are we going to go from there? Um, and where I'd like to go from there is, uh, you know, let, let's let's get along. Yeah, I was just thinking, though, as far as Genesis, there yeah. is this, if there was a six-day creation about 10,000 years ago, the problem of evil was greatly diminished, and with evolution, it's hugely magnified. So, and I'm, I'm supposing that that wasn't really discussed. <clears throat> to, to, to talk about evolution and evil being synonymous is it, your spin. And it's not my spin. I don't see <coughs> evolution uh, being imbued with any evil at all. I see it in a, in a more uh, neutral. I see no evil or good. It just moves along. So to, that's a moral judgment you're making. That transcends the realities. And it's certainly worth, worth doing but it's more than the theory itself says. Uh, a couple things. One is, is that uh, there's a psychiatrist who's kind of my mentor. Not in the sense that I work with him. Yeah. I just respect his work. And he has uh, 18 common mistakes in communication. Let's talk about relationships. Sure. And the first one he mentions is truth. Mm -hmm. I'm right. No, I'm right. You're wrong. I'm right. Mm -hmm. You can see how that works with relationships. Yeah. The second thing I want to say is I want to thank you for what you've done because although all these major religions have mixed histories, absolutely, what you've done is I think trying to reduce the harm that some of the religions have done. And I appreciate that very much. Sir, yeah, um, my biggest problem with the uh, Abrahamic religions, the Jewish, Christian, Muslim, I cannot accept that we are superior to life. I believe that everything is, there are our cousins out there, mm -hmm. even the uh, oak tree. And because of this, I have left the Christian faith. I'm one foot in atheism and one foot in pantheistic doctrine, sort of like Einstein and Carl Sagan sure. and so forth. How do I relate to the trinity of the religions there? Am I an outsider altogether, uh, like a Hindu or Buddhist? How would you relate to that? Well, I mean, you try to focus on the things you have in common rather than your differences. What you have in common with those people, at least the, the, the best of them, is that, I mean, I don't know you, what you're all like. Maybe you are concerned that uh, certain people are going blind because they are infested with parasites in African rivers, and you'd like to prevent their blindness by giving them some pills that will wipe out river blindness. And I think you would probably share that belief with a good Christian Jew, Muslim, and New Buddhist. So I don't think you're on the outside. Theologically, yes. Uh, in terms of being a, a human being and a humanitarian and a humanist, I don't see you on the outside at all. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Sir. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you have a response for something I think is one of the more underlying issues, and that's overpopulation. because. As the competition for resources gets stronger, the ability to compromise gets poorer, and all the religions talk about being fruitful and multiply, because way back when they were warriors, and you need lots of warriors. But what do we do to try and get the religious folks to say, we don't need everybody to have lots of kids? You, uh, you, you, you instruct them in the lessons of evolution that their overpopulation will lead to decimation and it's not a pleasant thought. That's an overly simplistic thing. There's no clean answer to that. This is kind of along the same lines in that those of us who um, 
are atheists, and, and, and I agree with what you say with regards to tolerance of diversity and toler you know, tolerance among different views. But um, in tolerating some of the religious uh, principles, uh, I think there's a concern of religion stopping or preventing science or taking science backwards or having cultural effects that have bigger, uh, mm -hmm. just like he said, that, that there's that concern there. And, and um, I think that's where some of us begin to have a problem. Yeah, and, and, and get back to the, pull it all together. I mean, the, the idea here that I suggested was if you can get through, it's not literally true in regard to scientific type writing in scripture, then the next thing is to start questioning um, be fruitful and multiply, and not take that literally. And that's the direction I'd like to go. So it answers your question. Yes, sir. But in doing that, comes back to the discussion you have on how important the truth is. I am in total agreement on having the respectful conversations, on, on having discussions and not being in people's faces. But even if we could get everybody to talk peacefully, if you don't have the courage to go after truth, and if you let what you do believe to be your religion, stop you from learning what is truth and what science can know as truth and how we can solve problems that we do have. We can still peaceably do a whole lot of damage. So, so you're, you're arguing for truth at all costs? I'm, I'm arguing Regardless what the costs are. I mean, I don't go that far. I, I'm Maybe arguing with going toward it, not being adamant about it in every conversation. Yeah. But that, that needs to be the ultimate. Well, I mean, that, that, I, I, I agree and in terms of the truth about the realities, the literal realities about the real world. Uh, we we you know, should go after the truth. That's what, what the thesis here is to start with. You know. But sometimes it's little by little uh, with somebody who holds a belief like uh, strongly in, say, a religion mm -hmm. or something. And just planting doubt begins the process. And by doing it in a way that doesn't offend people, if you can possibly do it, because the minute you start being offensive and combative, they're going to work, click, put up a barrier, and you're going to get nowhere, no matter how much sense you make. That's, that, that's the fallacy in, among many people who think they're going to have a, a, an effect. Uh, the psychology that needs to be uh, put into the equation. And so in that sense, uh, the truth has to be dealt with in that context. And if you, if you don't, you're not going to really get anywhere. There's been some studies on the heart rate. When the heart rate gets above 100, forget rationality. Yeah. And if, if the, the conversation develops in such a way you feel criticized or attacked or something like that, get defensive, counterattack, the heart rate gets up there, <clears throat> for that reason. Fight or flight is not terribly rational. It's an <coughs> animal response, and you're not thinking anymore, and sometimes it leads you in the wrong direction. And, you know, that's like, well, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Well, Thank <laughs> you.